Okay, it's recording. We are live. All right. Welcome, everybody. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all for joining us. This is the VCU Internal Medicine Grand Rounds, the second one for this academic year. So thank you all for joining us. Today is one of our uh, special four sessions throughout the year, the CPC conference series uh, led by our internal medicine chief residents. So um, we, um, uh, I'm gonna introduce Dr. Ott here in a minute, but um, if you guys have any questions for grand rounds in general, you can email me, uh, Dr. Karen uh, um, um, Carr, excuse me, or Thomas Bryan, so we can help you all uh, improve grand rounds for the audience. So uh, you can also go to the website. We will work on updating the videos and all the information, but please um, let us know if you run into any trouble with CE credits or the like. So uh, for today, we will, oh, is it giving you an echo? Sorry, I'll fix that in a minute. Sorry for the audio, we'll fix that in a minute. So um, to get us started with the CPC conference today, um, Dr. Eric Ott is going to uh, get us started. Uh, let me, we will bring back the, if anybody online, if you want to take a picture of the CE credit, sorry, uh, we will bring it back at the end of the uh, lecture. Um, we'll just, um, if you guys want to take it, I'll pause for five seconds. If you want to take a picture of this or write down the code. All right, we'll bring it back up at the end of the hour. Okay, let me switch. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being in attendance, and thanks to all who are attending virtually via Zoom. Um, we're going to get started with the, the CPC conference. Just to review the format very briefly, I will take five minutes to introduce the case, um, and then the bulk of the time will be given to our case discussant, um, who is going to talk through the case, dissect it, um, and uh, work through the thought process of coming to a differential diagnosis. Um, at the end of that, we will invite um, a content expert into the discussion uh, to talk more about the diagnosis um, and the relevant workup and things like that. And then we'll leave a little bit of time at the end for audience uh, Q&A. So starting uh, briefly uh, with our learning objectives, again, to identify key components in the patient's presentation, especially relevant findings in the history, physical exam labs, and imaging to generate a differential diagnosis and to use evidence-based medicine to support the diagnostic approach and use critical thinking throughout the process. So today we have a case of a 55-year-old man who presented with refractory leg swelling, hypertension, and fatigue. He's a 55-year-old male who has a history of hyperlipidemia and obstructive sleep apnea, who presented for evaluation of refractory leg swelling as well as lethargy. His initial symptoms started approximately six weeks prior to presentation when he was seen by a cardiologist at his home hospital for new onset of leg swelling. At that time, he was reportedly uh, found to have high blood pressure, and he was started on several blood pressure medicines, according to his family. He was also started on a diuretic, but the swelling has persisted and is getting worse despite that. Uh, his family has also noticed that he's a little bit less responsive and more lethargic this week, so they brought him to the emergency room to be evaluated. Uh, a review of the patient's outside medical records reveals two non-VCU hospitalizations in the past six weeks. One was for refractory hypertension as well as hypokalemia. A second was for AKI and slight elevation in the patient's LFTs. Because of that LFT elevation, imaging was obtained during his second hospitalization that revealed a mass of the pancreatic head with numerous metastases to the liver. According to his family, a biopsy was taken and they're still waiting for results. Aside from the patient's worsening fatigue, he has had increasing complaints of feeling weak as well as difficulty sleeping. As the leg swelling has gotten worse, uh, they've also, his family has also noticed some blisters forming on his legs. Some of them have burst and are draining clear liquid. The patient otherwise denies shortness of breath, orthopnea, chest pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, or other additional symptoms. Um, not a ton of relevant information um, in the review of history. He does have obstructive sleep apnea and hyperlipidemia. He occasionally uses alcohol, but does not use tobacco or other drugs. 
Uh, he lives with his family in a multi-generational home. He has no known drug allergies. And his only medications are those that were started when he was recently diagnosed with hypertension and uh, lower extremity swelling. Uh, so you can see those listed here on the slide. As far as his physical exam, um, I'll highlight some relevant findings here. His blood pressure was elevated at 157 over 100, um, but otherwise his vitals uh, relatively normal. Um, he was uncomfortable and fatigued appearing, but not in apparent distress. He had a normal HEENT exam, a normal neck and thyroid exam, normal cardiac exam, and then just mildly increased work of breathing on his respiratory exam, but no wheezing or crackles. Um, his abdominal exam was largely normal. Um, and in his extremities, he had three plus pitting edema extending upward to the knees and also an erythematous pustular or and vesicular rash overlying both of his legs with lesions in various stages of healing. Um, neurologically intact, uh, just somewhat somnolent and slow to respond um, and normal mood on psych evaluation. Uh, some basic lab work that was obtained in the emergency room is uh, displayed on this slide. Um, so I'll let you all take a look at that for just a second. Um, and uh, getting into some imaging, uh, again, on the CT abdomen pelvis, demonstrating numerous hepatic masses concerning for metastatic disease. They recommended further evaluation with an abdominal MRI, which was performed um, and demonstrated a 3.6 centimeter pancreatic head mass uh, with arterial enhancement compatible with a neuroendocrine neoplasm, as well as innumerable hepatic metastatic lesions involving all segments. And finally, we have uh, a little bit of information from the biopsy of one of his liver masses, uh, which overall was consistent with a well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor. <clears throat> So uh, with that information concluded, I'm gonna introduce our case discussant, Dr. Evan Ritter. Um, Dr. Ritter came to VCU for his training in internal medicine after completing uh, uh, his medical degree at Wake Forest uh, University School of Medicine. After completion of his internship and residency in internal medicine here, he stayed with the program as a chief medical resident before he joined the division of hospital medicine as an academic hospitalist. He has lately also taken on the role of physician informaticist uh, and he works as a physician builder alongside Epic to optimize the new medical record for VCU's unique patient care needs. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce to you, Dr. Evan Ritter. All right, thank you, Dr. Ott, for the introduction. Uh, I'm looking forward to going through this case with you guys. So uh, after I was asked to discuss this case, uh, I started thinking about resources that could help me prepare for this presentation. And I remembered an episode of The Curbsiders uh, where their case discussant did a really nice job of going through an unknown case and highlighting uh, the important parts of that, his reasoning and introducing terminology uh, useful for clinical decision making. Uh, and one of the resources referenced in the podcast was this website, clinicalreasoning.org. Uh, so it was uh, made in partnership with the Journal of General Internal Medicine. So I'll be referencing the terminology covered in this on this webpage. Uh, and if anyone is interested in learning more about clinical reasoning, would point you to this webpage uh, and also the podcast as well. If you want to see someone a little more experienced in clinical reasoning, go through a case. So the first thing we need to do with our case is come up with a problem representation. So we need to take all this information Dr. Ott shared with us uh, and put it in a, uh, distill it down and put it in a format that we can use uh, to start coming up with our differential diagnosis. So highlighting some things that stood out to me as I started to look at this case. Our patient has lower extremity edema and lethargy. newly diagnosed hypertension at his previous hospitalization he was found to be hypokalemic and we have this new mass of the pancreatic head with liver metastases my assumption is going to be at this point this is probably the primary the pancreatic mass but again as we go through the case and learn more we may revise our problem representation Next thing that I thought was interesting is the lower extremity blisters. And then as was noted before, patient is hypertensive. Tensive, uh, and in the setting of being on three medications, at least the Losartan and the hydrochlorothiazide being at uh, maximum dose, as well, as well as a diuretic, I think we can update our problem of hypertension to resistant hypertension. 
His exam confirms the lower extremity edema, which is fairly significant. And then interestingly, the rash described on the physical exam seems to be a little bit different than from the presentation or the HPI. So on exam, he has this pustular rash on the lower extremities with lesions in various stages of healing. So I'm going to add that as a separate problem. I don't know if this is evolution of the initial rash or something new. Taking a look at the labs, we confirm hypokalemia. And with a bicarb of 31, I'm going to add metabolic alkalosis to the problem representation. We also have hyperglycemia and urinalysis with glucose, as well as yet another slightly different description of the rash, this time uh, of a vesicular rash. So we're going to say pustular dash vesicular rash, uh, which here in this presentation seems to be possibly a little bit different than the one he described on his history. Again, we'll have to come back to that later. He also has this swab that's positive for both herpes simplex and varicella zoster. Uh, again, something I'm not quite sure what to do with because we do have two different pathogens. So something I'm going to leave off my problem representation for now, but something I'm going to have to come back and figure out what to do with. The CT imaging referred the MRI, so I jumped straight to the MRI here, uh, which appearance on imaging was consistent with a neuroendocrine neoplasm and our liver biopsy consistent with a well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor. Now, I did take a look at all, or at least tried to look through some of the um, stains performed, looking for a hint, anything else that could have been hidden. Uh, and for now, I'm going to assume that these all these findings are consistent with the, um, the profile that uh, favors this neuroendocrine tumor. There certainly could something be something hidden in there, but I didn't think, at least for this discussion, that it was worth trying to go through any deeper. Uh, everything does seem to fit that this is a uh, differentiated neuroendocrine tuber. And so I'm going to update my problem representation to now say well-differentiated pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor with liver metastases. Again, assuming this is the primary. So a couple more uh, clinical reasoning terminologies. Uh, the next, we need to, to think of an illness script. So I like the analogy of imagining a drawer full of three by five index cards where you've jotted all of your notes down, whatever you can remember all the way from medical school to your training now. Uh, some of these cards are very well used with notes scratched out and jotted in the corners. Others are pretty much ignored in the back and some have somehow disappeared from the drawer entirely. But this is kind of your starting point. Uh, after that, we get to use all of a plethora of resources, and I'll try to point to the resources I used as I expanded my illness script throughout this uh, thought process or working through this case. One thing that can be very useful too is if you have the opportunity to find a diagnostic schema that fits. This is going to help you think 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 through things logically. Uh, consider uh, diagnoses that you may have missed, uh, and uh, just organize your thought process. So, as a hospitalist, more of a general internal medicine doctor there's a couple of things that jumped out that I felt like I could tackle. So the three things that jumped out that seemed like they, they fit something of, a, of an illness script buried in my drawer is resistant hypertension, hypokalemia, and metabolic alkalosis. So I turned to where I often turned as a chief uh, to look for diagnostic schema. The clinical problem solvers have an excellent app and web page with a collection of diagnostic schema, hoping I could uh, use other resources to, to build my differential. And uh, while I'll admit that I didn't immediately think of high aldosterone as the schema I was looking for, uh, it seemed to fit nicely with the elevated bicarb, blood pressure, and low potassium. We don't have a urine chloride, but it seemed like a nice place to start forming my differential. So expanding the schema, we don't have renin and aldosterone levels, but I thought this was, again, a nice way to start adding things to my differential. So things that jumped out as possibilities, we've got renal artery stenosis, a renin secreting tumor, adrenal adenoma, adrenal hyperplasia, and Cushing's. So we have imaging of the abdomen and pelvis. So they didn't comment on renal pathologies, uh, any issues with the adrenal glands. So uh, use this as my differential, but sort of focused on Cushing's. It seems like this could be a, a good reason or explanation. So we went to UpToDate to expand my illness script of, script of Cushing's, which I, I could remember the, the plethora and round face, but I couldn't nest electrolyte abnormalities, but uh, needed, needed help expanding my illness script uh, and was happy to find hypertension, lethargy, 
abnormal glucose tolerance, and edema as common and slightly less common uh, signs and symptoms of Cushing's. Looking a little further into Cushing's syndrome, uh, the disease is specific to the, the pituitary uh, or an ACTH dependent process. Uh, does, we don't see anything so far in this case to suggest an iatrogenic cause. Uh, we don't have imaging of the brain, so it could be a pituitary lesion, but uh, we, since we already have a mass, uh, it seems like ectopic ACTH is a good thing to consider and, and maybe to move up in our differential. Again, didn't see any adrenal tumors on the imaging we have so far. I did take a slight detour towards multiple endocrine neoplasias uh, because we're talking about endocrine uh, hormones and multiple sites and malignancies, uh, but was able to sort of push this back down in the differential uh, due to the fact that I didn't see any obvious signs of hypercalcemia. Uh, and taking a look at common presentations for men, one, we would expect hyperparathyroidism to be one of the, the most common ma manifestations, I believe 70, 80% or so. Uh, and typically we would start to see these things by age 50, our patient being 55, a little late for this, uh, but did want to share with you that this was one of the things that, that kind of came as I was sorting through my, my drawer of illness scripts. Now expanding a little bit on ectopic ACTH, again, the thing that I remembered was small cell carcinomas, which is the most common cause of ectopic ACTH production, but was again happy to see that neuroendocrine tumors of the lung, pancreas, and thymus could also produce ectopic ACTH, as well as intrathoracic tumors. We don't have any, any imaging of the chest, so can't necessarily rule out uh, those as causes, uh, but again, uh, was nice to see that neuroendocrine tumors can cause this. So for now, trying to pull some things out of my problem representation and figure out where to focus next, I took the things that fit with ectopic ACH, moved them over, and sat them aside for now. So now I'm left with two things that I have nothing prepared for in my drawer of illness scripts. I have a well-differentiated pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, uh, as well as this rash. And with an effort to avoid the rash as long as possible, I'm gonna focus on the neuroendocrine tumor. <laughs> so up to date has a really nice uh, table describing neuroendocrine tumors. I'm making a little bit of a jump to say this is a functional neuroendocrine tumor uh, because it is well differentiated and we do seem to have some sort of hormone production here. Uh, the most common uh, being secretions of insulin and gastrin, insulinomas and Zollinger Ellison respectively. Neither of these fit our patient's presentation. And thankfully on the list, there is ACTH OMA and Cushing syndrome as a cause. Also reassuring to see that it's thought to account for four to 16% of all ectopic Cushing's. So reassurance that maybe I'm on the right track here. Going back to the problem representation, I now have to tackle the rash, unfortunately. Um, so one of the nice things from the Curbsiders podcast uh, that provided some reassurance to me is, is one thing you can do with your problem representation. If you can get it down and simplify it to a few different terms or something very specific, it might be something you can put in a search engine and get an answer. So let's see what happens. I typed in rash and pancreatic mass and uh-oh, glucogonoma came up. Um, that, that wasn't really what I was thinking, but uh, looks like it's back to the chart. So Taking a look at glucogonomas, it does involve the pancreas, and you do get this rash. Uh, more specifically, this rash is uh, necrolytic migratory erythema. Also mentions weight loss. Uh, didn't get a comment one way or another if our patient had weight loss, uh, and certainly in the setting of what we what I'm thinking now is ectopic ACTH production, it, it could uh, confound uh, the typical presentation. Looking into necrotory migratory erythema, which I'm pretty sure is completely new to me. Uh, it's, a it's the common presentation of glucogonoma syndrome or the presenting symptom in about 70 to 80% of cases. Typically begins as papules and plaques involving the pa face, perineum extremities, uh, and often affects mucous membranes. Uh, the distribution of our patient's rash doesn't seem to fit this as well, but it's kind of hard to ignore the, the, the Google result here of this, this association. So I pulled up some images. I feel like it's always helpful to take a look. Again, we don't have images of our patient's rash, uh, but potentially the legs, although these other sites, we don't, don't hear about this involvement or it's not described and, and they look to be a fairly significant rash. So again, I don't know if uh, ectopic ACTH production is somehow changing our presentation here. It certainly could be, 
uh, but I wasn't confident in saying for sure this is the, the rash that we're dealing with. The other thing I thought would be useful is, has this ever been seen before? So I was able to find a, a case review and a, a literature review looking at ACTH secreting pancreatic neoplasms. Uh, and it has been described. So 40% or so of patients uh, have had some other hormone produced uh, with presentations of Zollinger, Ellison, uh, insulinoma, et cetera. Oftentimes, uh, they didn't present at the same time one presented for the other. So it is certainly possible we have the glucagonoma. It would be very interesting for a CPC, but I I, I don't feel confident that, that we have enough here to say for sure that's what's going on in addition to ACTH secretion. And now back to the swab that I wasn't comfortable putting on my problem representation, but have to deal with now. Uh, it's positive for both herpes simplex and varicella zoster. So one thing I try to do if I, I get a result that's confusing or multiple pathogens is uh, potentially set it aside as a contaminant or something that's not accurate. Uh, so I actually called our lab this week and said, hey, what tests do we use? So we actually do PCR testing uh, and this PCR test uh, actually tests for all of these viruses. Uh, and if I wanted to set it aside, I now find it fairly hard to do so because the sensitivity and specificity is pretty good for the test. So we at least, uh, I, I think I have to say now we do have an infection with both of these viruses. Is it on top of another cause for this rash? Certainly could be. Uh, but I do have to, to think that this is uh, at least a secondary infection, if not the primary cause of the rash. The other confusing thing is the presentation doesn't really fit with what I think of, what I have in my drawer of illness scripts for herpes simplex and varicella zoster. We typically expect a dermatomal distribution, uh, face, genitals, et cetera, and being involved. Uh, herpes simplex, simplex tends to occur in a younger age and recur several times. We didn't get that history that could be there. Um, varicella zoster, typically our older patients. Uh, the description of the varicella zoster rash or the typical uh, presentation seems to fit a little bit more with the rash that we have. Uh, so again, um, hard. this rash continues to be a little bit difficult to deal with. Uh, but you know, both do uh, remain in the host sensory ganglion after primary um, infection. So maybe we've got some sort of recurrence uh, in the setting of, of everything else going on with our patient. Uh, and while I was uh, looking through this article, it, it did confirm that these are uh, examples of patients and I apologize, I didn't reference uh, th these are, uh, this paper I was looking at was looking for examples of patients uh, infected with both uh, varicella and herpes uh, and their body sites did fit with the typical locations you would expect these rashes. So next thing I tried to do is, is are there examples of disseminous, disseminated cutaneous herpes virus infections? So things that involve multiple dermatomes uh, and there is a condition known as eczema herpeticum, uh, as you'd expect from the name, typically associated with atopic dermatitis, often in patients on some sort of uh, immunosuppressive drugs. Uh, but it could also occur after conditions such, such as thermal burns. So maybe, again, in this unique situation of this neoplasm, uh, likely atopic ACTH, maybe our presentation is a little bit different. It is most commonly uh, caused by HSV type 1 or 2. Uh, and the description of the rash fits reasonably well with what our patients describe, these blisters that move on to crust over, form erosions, and heal over two to six weeks. Uh, the pictures are, again, involving sites we would expect uh, more often uh, in herpes virus infections, uh, but I, I liked these best because they seemed to illustrate the, the description I was reading of, of the rash in general. There were some uh, pictures uh, involving flexor surfaces, which you'd expect with eczema as well. Uh, but I felt these pictures kind of showed the, the appearance of the rash a little bit better. So trying to finalize my differential and figure out what to do with the rest of my problem representation. I think it's safe now at least my best guess with the information I've been given is to take this pancreatic mass and say that we have a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor that's producing ectopic ACTH. At this time, I don't think I have enough information to say for sure whether we have glucagon production as well. Again, less common, the rash doesn't fit as well. So leaving it at the on my differential, but definitely lower. I don't think I can say for sure right now uh, whether we potentially have both ACTH and glucagon secretion.
And then the rash, as much as I would, again, like to attribute it to the necrolytic uh, erythema uh, that is, or NEM that's typical of uh, the glucogonoma, I, I think with the sensitivity and specificity of the rash, uh, feel most confident saying that we do have at least some form of disseminated herpes virus infection, likely limited to cutaneous, as we didn't see any other systemic signs, but again, uh, could be involving other organ systems, just didn't have any information there. Mm -hmm. So additional workup I'd like to see. I'm, I'm hoping our answer comes from our pathology. So if we can do some additional testing of our biopsy, uh, hopefully we're able to use a previous biopsy, but again, if we need another sample, but we'd really like to see, we should be able to test that for ACTH and glucagon. Uh, if we did want to do a skin biopsy, which I, I think we can get our answer from the pathology, uh, but there are some characteristic findings of necrolytic migratory erythema. So uh, could potentially be helpful if, uh, we're struggling with a diagnosis. And the last thing I wanted to cover, uh, things that could be useful when thinking about elevated ACTH, but maybe not as useful in this case. Uh, we can measure the ACTH. In this case, we'd expect it to be high. Uh, and then the next step in our diagnosis is, or in our um, diagnostic algorithm is uh, either um, stimulation or suppression tests, as well as considering a pituitary MRI. I think, again, if we can get our answer from the biopsy, we may not need these imaging, but thinking about additional workup, things that could potentially be helpful, uh, pituitary MRI. Uh, and again, we never had uh, reported imaging of the chest. So uh, certainly common things for this ectopic ACTH production uh, involve the, the intrathoracic neoplasms or the, the small cell. And so could also consider imaging of the chest. I'm not sure if uh, that imaging would also help us with staging or, or future treatment. So that's how I approach the case. We'll open it up for any questions. Any questions from the audience members here? And if not, I'm really excited to hear what's going on. Pause, well, we have a few minutes. So uh, anything that's on your mind uh, that you want to hear more or thoughts? Okay. Uh, well, thank you. I appreciate your part of it. Um, if you want to introduce our expert, yeah. I'm going to try to do some magic. Cool. Yeah, I'm excited to introduce our uh, the case expert for this uh, patient case. Um, Dr. Angeliki Stamatuli is an assistant professor of endocrinology at VCU Health. Um, she completed her medical education at the University of Patras in Patras, Greece, and then completed internal medicine residency training at Bridgeport Hospital within the Yale New Haven Health System. Uh, she remained at Yale for her fellowship training in endocrinology before joining uh, VCU's Division of Endocrinology, Diabetes, and Metabolism in 2019. Um, she's uh, very familiar with the, the case in question, and so I'm excited to hear uh, what she has to share with us. Uh, yes, hi, can you hear me well? Yes, ma'am. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, so first of all, I would like uh, Dr. Ott to thank you for the invitation. Uh, I think Dr. Ritter, thank you for breaking down uh, so nicely the case. I'm sorry that I was not able to um, be there today, but unfortunately I'm in the clinic, so I couldn't make it. Um, give me one second, please. Let me share my screen. Oops, give me one second, please. Can you see my screen? Yes, we see your screen. Okay, yep. Perfect. Um, so actually, um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, I, uh, I probably I cannot give all the answers for the patient, specifically like for the rash, because I think um, part of it was also a coexistent infection that was going on at the time of the presentation. But I think, um, uh, Dr. Ritter, like definitely the way that the patient presented um, uh, gave us like a like this is raised the suspicion of uh, possible ectopic ACTH syndrome. Um, so actually, I will uh, start with um, um, some like basic information about the ectopic ACTH syndrome, and then I will try to in introduce like some of the information that we already got for the patient. 
So uh, the definition of ectopic ACTH syndrome applies to a condition of endogenous hypercortisol that's not sustained by an ACTH secreting non-pituitary tumor. So the term ectopic means that the ACTH is produced and released in an unsuited place in comparison to the utopic pituitary origin of ACTH that we see either in physiological states or in Cushing's disease. So uh, this is a quite rare situation. So the proportion of patients actually um, that that, uh, that develop like ACTH dependent Cushing's is actually very small. Imagine that's the third case that I'm seeing throughout my career. If you will think that the endogenous Cushing's syndrome uh, is generally reported at our incidence of no higher than 2.4 cases per million, and 10% is the percent the, the percentage actually uh, of patients that present with uh, endogenous Cushing's due to ectopic ACTH, uh, you know, you, you can imagine that this is not a condition that we are interacting at a, in a, at a single like um, basis, like a, a, our daily routine. The first case of ectopic cushion was described in 1928 when uh, Brown described a case of pl pluri glandular tumor. And actually he described the case of a bearded woman with diabetes who had an old cell carcinoma of the lung. Um, in the 1960s, Midor described like patients who had lung tumors that the extracts of which contained bioactive ACTH. In 1969, Midor identified cases of patients with Cushing syndrome in which ACTH was produced by non-endocrine tumors. So since then, multiple case reports and series have been reported in literature with ectopic Cushing's derived from different types of underlying malignancy. So um, the ectopic ACTH syndrome is classified as overt when the tumoral source is easily detected by the initial endo um, uh, endocrine and radiological investigations. As covert, it occurs in patients when they present with hypercortisolemia, uh, but the ectopic source is not detected during the initial test, but it is uh, discovered on subsequent evaluation or during prolonged follow-up and occult um, uh, ectopic ACTH syndrome when um, patients have features of Cushing syndrome. Uh, all the tests indicate an ectopic source, but the primary lesion is not identified even after prolonged or repeated follow-up. So um, the prevalence, and I think I think we kind of touch base on that. Like there could be like different types of uh, tumors that could produce like ectopic ACTH. Um, the majority of the of the tumors uh, are uh, coming from the chest. Uh, so lung and thymus uh, tumors are the first are coming up uh, in the in the differential, but also like medullary thyroid cancer, severe chromocytomas could be very um, could be very prevalent, uh, and also like tumors that are coming from the abdomen, specifically from the pancreas and the colon. So our patient was diagnosed with well differentiated neuroendocrine tumor of the pancreas that was metastatic to the liver. That was like what the initial uh, the pathology showed. Uh, there are some other uh, tumors that have been described in literature, uh, and, but they are much uh, more rare. Uh, ovarian carcinoma and prostate carcinoma are um, the more commonly seen, but also we can see it in patients with melanoma, we can, uh, mesothelioma, lymphoma, salivary gland tumors, breast cancers, hepatocellular carcinoma, or esophageal carcinoma. But the, again, the frequency is uh, very small. So... Um, we know that uh, ACTH, I'm taking you back to our physiology, uh, ACTH um, has like, a, her main precur precursor actually is a pro op opiomelanocortin. So the, P I, I will use the term POMC just like to, for, um, for the presentation now. So the POMC gene is expressed in pituitary and non-pituitary tissues, including the brain, the placenta, gonads, GI system, lung, liver, kidney, lymphocytes. So several post-translational uh, POMC modification steps are required uh, for the polypeptide hormone secretion. So there are some pro-hormone convertases that um, play a critical role in determining the manifestation and the, the function of the peptides at the tissue level through some uh, site-specific cleavages. So um, non-pituitary tumors uh, demonstrate a spectrum of altered POMC gene expression and processing because the pro-hormone 
convertase enzyme might lack or might be abnormal, resulting in preferential uh, generation of smaller fragments, uh, such as, for example, like the, the vita uh, melanocyte stimulated hormone. That's why um, uh, we're seeing that patients that have small cell lung cancer might release like intact uh, POMC, whereas carcinoid tumors might release ACTH and smaller peptides. And sometimes some of these patients present with hyperpigmentation. Um, so the ectopic ACTH uh, syndrome is not due to ectopic hormone production, but it represents a cancer-induced amplification of a biological feature that normally exists in the cells from which the cancer uh, originates. Um, so I, I, I just, uh, I think we described like some of the clinical symptoms um, that um, the patient presented. And I think if we will see like this review here, this retrospective study from NIH, um, we will understand that um, some of the symptoms that were already reported in literature that patients with um, ectopic ACTH syndrome might present that we'll see that most of them fit that presentation of our patient. So he had like muscle weakness, he had high blood pressure, he had like hypokalemia, uh, edema. Uh, I think that was what took him initially to the hospital, like the, the lower extremity edema, um, insomnia, and impercognition in older mental status. So we see that um, uh, our patient had most of the clinical manifestation at diagnosis. And also during his hospitalizations, we found out that he had like some like uh, worsening hyperglycemia uh, and infections. The diagnosis actually of Cushing's of ectopic Cushing's is quite challenging. I will try to describe the steps briefly, but I would recommend uh, to consult endocrinologists because definitely it's a challenge, and I think we we require like all the specialties to be involved. So in general, once hypercortisolemia is suspected. The diagnosis is confirmed biochemically by a combination of a 24-hour urine-free cortisol, overnight one milligram dexamethasone suppression test, um, and late night uh, salivary cortisol uh, tests. Uh, the first line tests have obviously high sensitivity. So for patients that we have high index of suspicion, we usually perform um, two uh, of the first line tests. The choice now is based on, first of all, on our suspicion, but also on some pitfalls that are related to the test. For example, if we suspect that um, a patient has an adrenal source of uh, hypercortisolism, like the first uh, test that we'd, we would think is the one milligram dexamethasone suppression test, since that shows like a uh, higher sensitivity. Um, this test, like we're giving, for example, dexamethasone one milligram at bedtime or at 11 o'clock, uh, and then the, we measure like cortisol and dexamethasone levels uh, in the morning at eight o'clock. Um, if like a, a cortisol level is less than 1.8, uh, then we know that the the cortisol production um, is excluded. Uh, but uh, in, if a patient, for example, has like oral takes oral contraceptive pills, that we know that could uh, the the estrogen could increase like the cortisol binding globulin and raise falsely actually raise the total cortisol levels. That would not be a test of choice for us. So then we might need to use like a, an alternate test. In this situation, like a late night salivary cortisol and more than two tests might be indicated. So um, we choose like the test based on our suspicion and based on some other pitfalls that the, the patient uh, might have, like based on the history and physical exam. Now, if the results are abnormal, uh, we have to exclude that we don't have like any physiological causes of hyper cortisolism that could interfere with the, the testing. For example, infections, sepsis, pregnancy, uh, even obesity, severe obesity. Sometimes it's very difficult to differentiate. So we perform some dynamic tests in addition, if we, we want to shed more light to our differential, uh, we're using like a CRH or desmopressin after dexamethasone suppression to differentiate the etiology. And if the tests are abnormal and other causes have been ruled out, then Cushing syndrome is suspected. Um, so after the endogenous hypercortisolemia is confirmed biochemically, the next step, as um, um, Dr. Uh, Ritter said, is to determine if there is an ACTH dependence or not of the hypercortisolemia. And obviously, we're measuring the ACTH levels. 
Now, if the ACTH are more than 20 in the presence of hypercortisolism, the diagnosis is confirmed. Uh, once the ACT, ACTH dependence is confirmed, we have to determine whether or not this is pituitary or ectopic. So the next test that we are using are the high dose dexamethasone suppression test, which they take, both of them actually take advantage of the fact that ACTH secretion by the pituitary adenomas uh, that cause like, you know, Cushing's disease is only relatively resistant to the negative feedback regulation by the steroids, whereas the non-pituitary tumors that are associated with ectopic ACTH uh, syndrome are uh, completely resistant to that feedback inhibition. Uh, so um, I usually am um, choosing like the high dose dexamethasone suppression test because it doesn't involve many steps for the patient. So we're giving eight milligram um, dexamethasone the night before. So usually we're saying like at 11 o'clock or at the time that, uh, that the bedtime and we measure uh, plasma cortisol uh, in the morning. Uh, usually, uh, we would expect after the dexamethasone administration to have suppression of the plasma cortisol by 50% compared to baseline, and that suggests uh, Cushing's disease. Um, if, like, we do not, uh, if we're seeing that uh, we, we, the, the suppression is not uh, is not um, achieved, then uh, ectopic Cushing's is suspected. Also, sometimes we can use like the cortisol levels to make the diagnosis. So cortisol level more than five, again, um, is consistent with ectopic Cushing's. So um, if Cushing's disease is likely and we're, we get like the results, then we perform MRI of the pituitary. Uh, if the pituitary mass is more than six millimeters or specifically if, specifically if it is more than 10, then the Cushing's diagnosis is confirmed. But if like the, the, the mass is less, less than six millimeters or we cannot identify like um, any like um, pituitary adenoma, then uh, we, we will need to perform one like invasive test, which is called inferior petrosal venous sampling, which is the gold standard of like to confirm the diagnosis. Um, I, I'm not going to elaborate on this, but in general, it's an invasive procedure in which ACTH levels are sampled from the veins that drain the pituitary gland and are compared with the ACTH levels in the peripheral blood. So, if like the the PS the the IPSS is negative for Cushing's disease, then we will perform workup to rule uh, to actually um, uh, localize the tumor that produces ACTH. So in regards to the imaging studies, it is very cost effective to obtain images of the chest first, since most ACTH secreting tumors are located there. PET imaging is a useful localization tool, specifically like the Gallium 68 Dota Tate uh, scan. Uh, PET CT or PET MRI have become the most reliable means of detecting both occult primary tumors, uh, but also like uh, metastasis. Um, it, it has like very high affinity for the somatostatin receptor. Uh, type 2, uh, coupled with a special resolution with a CAT scan or the MRI, and they can take generally detect and localize even small tumors that they are expressing um, uh, somatostatin uh, receptors. Um, I thought the dotated scan has a high sensitivity in up to like 80% in localizing ectopic, um, uh, ectopic cushings. Um, so um, another important thing is that the well-differentiated tumors um, tend to have more um, Dota date uptake and minimal FDG uptake. Whereas like the poorly differentiated tumors have um, ha less like uh, somatostatin expression and high metabolic activity. So they have like higher FDG uptake and can appear, uh, appear as false negatives on uh, scientigraphy. So going back to our patient, um, even though, though, like, you know, I prescribed like the whole process of, you know, how to diagnose patients, you know, um, we, we didn't do all these diagnostic tests. Um, 
we we got like a two elevated levels of uh, cortisol when he initially presented and also reviewing the chart we saw that he has like severe persistent hypokalemia for the past like six weeks prior to the presentation he had like metabolic alkalosis and also like uh, gradually in, um, worsening hyperglycemia. Uh, his blood sugar actually was 247, like around the time of, of the presentation. So given the fact that uh, the patient had neuro, uh, an already diagnosed neuroendocrine tumor, that was like at the time of our evaluation, we had already taken like the diagnosis. The patient was critically ill. Uh, he presented with uh, weight gain, new onset hypertension, new onset hyperglycemia, uh, new, uh, new onset and persistent hypokalemia, the alkalosis, he, he had auto mental status. Uh, and eventually like we found that the, um, the rash was associated with an infection, uh, with a varicella infection. And like also um, there was a suspicion for a uh, respiratory infection from the um, in critical care team. Um, we had like a higher suspicion for an ectopic Cushing's. Um, what was also helpful was the imaging of the patient. Um, that like we had like from an outpatient facility where like his CAT scan of the head did not show any overt pituitary lesion. Obviously, it's not so sensitive as the MRI. However, though, I mean, we we saw that there was not like a gross like mass, uh, and the MRI of the abdomen um, showed bilateral adrenal hypertrophy uh, without nodules. So. Um, we checked like an ACTH level for this patient and surprisingly was not that high as we would imagine. Um, we did the, so, so he had like an FTG PET um, again performed at the outpatient fac facility and it was negative for any um, uh, lesions. Uh, and uh, actually that was going against his other imaging, which he had uh, actually um, an abdominal MRI, which was showing like the pancreatic mass and also like uh, with metastasis to the liver. Uh, and that goes along with what we said before that probably a PET dot uh, would be the, the test of choice for this patient. We tried to um, to, to take like um, a, a, the liver biopsy um, uh, sample that he had like in an outpatient facility and we tried to stain it for ACTH. The result actually came back and that was negative. So the question that was raised from the team is that, is that decreased immunoreactivity suggestive of other diagnoses than ectopic Cushing's? And actually the question is no, because there's an old study, but after reviewing and checking 80 different tissue samples from patients with ectopic Cushing's, it was found that there is a negative correlation between the extent of malignancy and the immunoreactivity for ACTH. And the, the, the negative pathology staining for ACTH was attributed to either sampling other artifacts um, the fact that some highly malignant tumors rapidly secrete ACTH, so but there are insufficient amounts stored in the tissue in order to be detected. And there are various uh, precursor forms of ACTH that might also explain the negative immunohistochemistry. So uh, we were not surprised and we didn't like change our differential based on that. Now, let's see um, how we should manage these patients. Um, so, the severe hypercortisolism due to ectopic um, ACTH syndrome is a life-threatening condition, and that demands actually a multidisciplinary approach to avoid morbidity and mortality. So we should all work together. The mainstays of the medical management are that, first of all, we have to address and treat the comorbidities that are induced from, the, from, hyper, from severe hypercortisolism reduce the cortisol levels. This is very cru crucial and specifically for the first weeks. Um, see if we can have like any definitive surgery, first of all, of the primary tumor and, and also like for the adrenals if needed uh, and see if we can provide some cancer treatment to start managing the, the tumor. So um, we need to all be aware that the given like the rapid onset of hypercortisolism, um, 
what we are seeing like in the ectopic Cushing syndrome, that could lead eventually to psychiatric, cardiovascular, thromboembolic, metabolic, or infectious complications that can be fatal. And they could be fatal irrespective of the tumor progression. So as intensivists, internal medicine providers, we need to, to be aware of them and we need to identify them. So first of all, some of these patients might present with uh, psychiatric symptoms. And I think our team actually is having one patient that, um, with a similar presentation that came with psychiatric uh, symptoms. So patients might have paranoia, agitation, psychosis. And the, in this condition, obviously, uh, corti like decreasing the cortisol level will be helpful. But we sometimes like we might need to give like some um, antipsychotic agents to assist with the management. Hypokalemia, we discussed it already. That was very profound to our patient. But also like some patients might present with severe hypokalemia and symptoms related to that, like muscle weakness, could be from the hypokalemia per se, uh, rhabdomyolysis or dangerous arrhythmias. In this situation, potassium replacement uh, also pl plays an important role. And um, mineralocortical receptor antagonists such as pyrolactone at high doses could be very helpful for the management. Uh, hyperleucemia, um, and it's, it's again, uh, something that we saw in our patient and was progressing, like, in other words, like in the end of May, he had like a, um, like a, a glucose level of 90. And then as he was like in the hospital, like he, um, reached like four and five hundreds, like requiring insulin drip. So the, the possible, first of all, the, the possible etiology of hyperglycemia is mainly insulin resistance from the excess cortisol excretion, increased hepatic gluconeogenesis, and impaired insulin secretion. It is very crucial to manage it because uh, by controlling um, the hyperglycemia, we reduce also the susceptibility to uh, infections. Speaking for infections, uh, some of these patients might present with life-threatening sepsis, uh, many opportunistic infections have been described in literature that uh, could present like in these patients, like for example, pneumocystic uh, pneumonia uh, is one of them. Uh, and also bowel perforation is very common to these patients and peritonitis. Um, we need to give uh, prophylaxis for pneumocystis. Uh, for in these patients, um, we 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 first of all start the treatment at the time of diagnosis, and we might need to continue it even like for two weeks after achieving uh, your cortisol desma, Even like for the patient has like definite treatment of that, and of course antibiotics if needed for other types of um, for other infections. Hypertension is again another complication. Again, this patient did not have history of hypertension and developed down like um, the past six weeks. Uh, we think that this is because of enhanced response to ag angiotensin to an activation of the mineralocorticoid receptor. Again, here, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, for example, spirolactone at high doses could be very, very helpful. And um, um, some thromboembolic um, complications, such as both involving arterial and venous thrombosis, have also been described. So um, we think that this is probably uh, associated with uh, uh, elevated uh, procoagulant factors, specifically like eight, nine, and mobilibrant fractures, impaired uh, fibrinolysis, and increased platelet aggregation. In these patients, we need to give them like um, uh, prophylaxis with heparin. And and the prophylaxis should be continued for at least two to four weeks after achieving your cortisol or surgery, or like if the patient has like permanent treatment. Uh, as we already discussed, surgical resection of the tumor could be therapeutic for both the underlying malignancy and for the ectopic uh, Cushing syndrome for the paraneo paraneoplastic manifestation. But there are some situations where like the, the tumors might not be able to be resected. And in this situation, we are thinking like more systemic treatment. In regards to the medical treatment, that would be our first choice if we have like metastatic tumor, if surgical treatment is not indicated, or if we have like uh, occult um, ectopic um, ACTH syndrome, where we have to continue the treatment for a prolonged period of time. And uh, just because we don't have a source, so this patient should be re-examined periodically with imaging. And if necessary, um, like we need to repeat the imaging periodically until the tumor can be located and treated. 
So um, one of the medications that we have been using uh, for the management of um, ectopic Cushing's is ketoconazole. Ketoconazole is an antifungal medication and is being used like for the management of Cushing's as well. So it inhibits actually um, like multiple enzymes, as we can see here with red, multiple enzymes uh, of the um, um, cytochrome P450 uh, that they are needed like for cortisol synthesis. And actually um, it impairs gonadal and adrenal steroidogenesis. It acts rapidly only on high doses. And um, we can see that we start usually at a low dose and very like we try to titrate it over time. Um, uh, there it has like a lot of side effects, unfortunately, and we have to be aware that it could affect the liver function. Uh, for male individuals that they are not in obviously in, in a critical um in a critical uh clinical presentation, uh but could cause like hypogonadism. It could cause QTC prolongation. So we have to be very cautious with the other medications that we are using. Um with it. Uh, and it could also block the synthesis of one alpha hydroxylase vitamin D. Vitamin D. So in this situation, like uh, obviously like we need to, to be aware and replace as needed with vitamin D. Levoketoconazole, which is an is a new medication that was approved like actually in um, December of 2021. Um is um, an, an adiomer of ketoconazole. It is uh, more potent than uh, inhibitor uh, and it is administered every 12 hours. So this is more practical, specifically in the outpatient setting. Um, we haven't had like uh, case reports of, with ectopic Cushing's, but that could be potentially be an option in the future to try. Metirapon uh, is um, another medication. It's a potent inhibitor of um, the uh, 11 uh, beta hydroxylase. It has like a rapid absorption, a rapid action. The fact that metirapon inhibits, um, as we can see here, the 11 beta hydroxylase results to elevated levels of 11 deoxycortisol and 11 deoxycorticosterone, which the, the first one is a precursor of cortisol, and the second one uh, has like similar uh, function with aldosterone. So that's why patients who have been taking like this medication have like increased risk to present with high. To, to develop actually hypokalemia and hypertension at the time uh, of use. Um, and it could also cause like um, uh, some like hirsutism in women. So we have to be cautious again. Oscilodrostat is a new medication. It works similarly to metirapon. Um, we have one case report that I was able to identify of three patients with ectopic Cushing's that um, were treated with this medication. And it seems that it so far has been successful. Mitotain is an adrenolytic uh, medication. It's used usually for the management of adrenocortical carcinoma. However, though, it has been used uh, in, um, for management uh, in patients with uh, ectopic Cushing's, as we can see here, um, like a, with the, the blue um, arrow, uh, it, it does work in multiple levels of the steroid synthesis. Um, obviously, um, it's... Um, it's a medication that requires specific attention because it could cause um, like other, uh, just because it causes like a medical adrenalectomy, we have to give it always with uh, steroids to prevent iatrogenic adrenal insufficiency, but also could have like a teratogenic effects. So we should be cautious in women of reproductive age uh, and has like some other side effects, including um, transaminitis and hypothyroidism. So we should always be careful and supplement if needed with other hormones. Mifepristone is a glucocorticoid receptor directed treatment. It blocks like the receptor of, um, uh, of cortisol. Um, it's very difficult to titrate, uh, but and like it, it, it's definitely being given specifically if patients develop hyperglucemia secondary to, hyper, to hypercortisolism. Uh, it could be given either as acute treatment or chronic treatment. And again, we have to be cautious because it could cause high blood pressure or hypokalemia. And it could be abortifacient for um, women of reproductive age. Octreotide um, is another medication, somatostatin receptor agonist. Uh, These medications um, are used like either monthly for treatment of neuroendocrine tumors, uh, 
but also like it could help like the ectopic ACTH secretion from some of these tumors. So it has been overall effective. It has like a positive uh, re response. For some other tumors though, that they are not like neuroendocrine might not have like any effect on reducing the tumor size, but it could definitely assist in the management and in the secretion of the ACTH. Etomidate uh, is an anesthetic. We all know it from the, our ICU. Uh, it is usually bridged with um, surgical adrenalectomy after two weeks of use. Um, this could be given in case of an emergency, but IV and always in the ICU. Um, and uh, obviously we have like very rapid results, but we have to be cautious about the respiratory status of the patient and also like the, um, the mental status. So, um, when we have like severe uh, ACTH dependent hypercortisolemia, uh, we need, and this is like according to um, the um, endocrine society recommendations, we need to start urgently treatment. And that is like even within 24 to 72 hours, specifically if life-threatening complications of cushions of hypercortisolemia might be present, for example, infection, pulmonary thromboembolism, cardiovascular complications, or acute psychosis. So, and obviously like we need to manage, as we said before, all the other associated disorders that might come with it. Uh, if like a patient has a, an infection, for example, give antibiotics, et cetera, what we just mentioned. If in the, in critical situations, like a domidate could be a first choice, uh, but again, as I said before, we need to, to bridge it with adrenalectomy, or we could consider try, like starting like more than one of the medications that I mentioned up, above. Um, for example, uh, one scheme that has been recommended and has been studied is mitotin metirapon and ketoconazole combination. Uh, and it seems that this like, um, was able like to decrease like in a one study that was performed in 2011 in Paris it was able to decrease like the urine free cortisol significantly significantly within 24 to 48 hours uh, and actually the patients were able to maintain um you uh you cortisolemic like after um the like for months after the um the initiation of the medication so like they were able to taper them off of some of them so this is actually the cortisol graph of our patient. Uh, so as we can see that when uh, he initially presented, the cortisol levels were very, very high. And um, so we started him on treatment. So we started him on ketoconazole, but much lower dose from what we described before. And we started him on octreotide to manage the underlying neuroendocrine tumor. We also covered him, backed him for uh, um, um for pneumocystic like prevention, uh, uh, potassium uh, re was replaced like periodically. Um, we did start him on insulin and he required at a point like insulin drip and DVT prophylaxis. Within the first um, like days, I would say four to five days, we noticed like some gra like gradual decrease of his cortisol level. So it was detectable. But then the sixth day, his cortisol started going up. So we increased the dose of ketoconazole. Um, the following weeks, we tried to increase the octreotide. We increased ketoconazole to 400 milligrams twice a day. But again, in that dose, um, he developed transaminitis. So we had to go back to 300 milligrams. He had some other complications during his course that we had to adjust like his medications. Um, he had developed tachycardia. Um, then we, we thought that better, like by increasing like octreotide uh, might be helpful um, instead of like just like up titrating ketoconazole, we could and start that second medication at that point due, due to other um, uh, complications that he had developed uh, on the like uh, about like one 10 days like after his presentation uh, we had to take him we had to take him off um, ketoconazole we kept him only on octreotide and at that point we were thinking whether or not we should start a dummy date the patient, though, had severe encephalopathy and risk for respiratory suppression. So at that time, the team did not want to start him um, on uh, treatment. Um, there was not very good prognosis, actually, for his neuroendocrine tumor. So we kind of like um, held like that plan. We started metirapon like a few days later. And actually, we see that his cortisol level responded like, uh, and actually at that time, uh, after the second dose, like his cortisol levels were detectable. 
After that, we gradually up titrated the dose of metirapone. And actually, um, we saw like, um, I would say like seven days, one week while being on metirapone, like he was, his um, um, cortisol levels reached like the nadir, like the lowest point that they had been throughout his course. At that point, though, we had to be cautious because patient had other issues that were going on, including like active infections. So at this point, we had to start him on uh, IV steroids just like to be able like to um, um, respond to the stress uh, and uh, while well, he was in the ICU setting. And at that point, like we held like the same dose. Uh, of metirapone. Um, the octreotide also like was uh, was maintained throughout throughout the treatment. Um, unfortunately, though, the patient uh, if, due to the comorbidities and being sick, like eventually like uh, became comfort care and like and then he passed like a few, a few days later. So the prognosis actually in patients with ectopic tumor is detected by the nature of the tumor. Um, the severity of hypercortisolism, hypokalemia is also another factor that could affect um, like their prognosis, the development of diabetes. Um, so with all these uh, factors, like most patients that uh, when they present, um, like, you know, like obviously like they might have like an advanced cancer and definitely that's a, that's a problem, but they might have other risk factors that could be manageable and they could be treat it and prevent like um and prevent them like from having like irreversible an irreversible course so regardless of the prognosis no patient should suffer from the effects of persistent hypercortisolism we could control it it's just like we need like an um an intervention and a rapid intervention of it so thank you very much for the um, inviting me today um let me know if you have any questions Thank you so much for the talk. Um, seeing here in person, do you guys have any questions, comments? No? Um, very thorough review. Um, seeing if anybody online has any questions, you can use the chat if anything is on your mind. Um, actually, I have a question from Dr. Mayer. Um, she she she's asking me if we we consider mitotane at that time. Actually, no. Um, we we didn't consider mitotane because there was a cross reaction with some of the medications that he was taking. So it was advised from our pharmacist to not use it. Thank you for answering that. All right. Well, that concludes today's grand rounds. Thank you both to our discussant and our expert. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.